Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. We hear about it all the time, and we see it in the news every day. Adversaries like China and Russia are radically redefining the threat environment. And they're not alone, with mid-tier actors like North Korea and Iran continuing to pose severe challenges given their nuclear ambitions. Add it up, and it's an incredibly dangerous world out there. And what makes it unique is the concurrency of all of these threats. It would be one thing to focus on these challenges in a sequential fashion, but it's quite another to juggle them all at once. Frankly, it is stretching our capabilities and capacity to a breaking point. You hear us talk about it all the time here at Mitchell. Only 20 B-2s, 185 F-22s, and limited munition stores can only go so far. But there's another part of the equation. Airplanes, missiles, and bombs are tools. It takes smart airmen to employ them the right way to net a desired effect. Use air power tools poorly and the results will suffer. So success comes down to helping airmen better understand strategy, operational concepts, and how to best employ technologies. Given that we just spent the past two decades fighting counterinsurgency battles and are now pivoting to peer-level threats, There's a lot of ground to make up from an intellectual standpoint, so our airmen are equipped to understand the challenges they'll face today and tomorrow, not aim points from the past. Each of the military service branches runs a set of institutions designed to help train their personnel. It's a function called Professional Military Education, or PME for short. Officers, enlisted, and select civilians engage in this enterprise at particular junctures in their careers. Today, we are super excited to host two leaders from one of the Air Force's lead PME institutions, Air Command and Staff College, which is part of Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base. We've got Colonel Matthew Berry, he's the Commandant of ACSC, and Colonel Sarah Bakhtiari, who is the Dean of Education at ACSC. And Colonel Berry, he comes to us from Air Force Special Operations Command background with time flying the MH-53 and CV-22 Ops Race. So Matt, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Slick. Awesome. So Sarah and I have history as lieutenants in the famed Triple Nickel Fighter Squadron. Sarah was our intelligence officer when we deployed and obviously kicked major butt in that job. And Sarah is a warrior scholar. She has her PhD from Denver, obviously massively talented. I've got to go off script here just for a second because uh, Sarah and I have got to give you a one screen. Oh, it's green. Well, I got to tell you, I want to say in the intro, I gave it my best shot. It's probably a good idea if you help us define your mission from the get-go. So first off, what I'd like to do is have you help folks understand where ACSC fits into the broader Air Force PME enterprise. And I mean, there's obviously squadron officer school for captains and in war college when you're a, a lieutenant colonel or a colonel. So can you break it down for us? Yes. Like ACSC is at the operational level of war. So when you look at the levels of war, you talk about tactical, operational, and strategic. Our enterprise at AU has three schools, one dedicated to each level. Our school is primarily focused on teaching people how to write O plans and be staff officers at an operational COCOM or the like. And then we also do leadership development for people who are going to go be leaders at the tactical level, like squadron commanders and DOs. Awesome. And what about enlisted and civilian PME opportunities? Those are handled primarily through the Barnes Center and their enterprise at the various bases across the U.S. for both Airman Leadership School and the NCO Academy. They also bring people into Maxwell Gunter for the Senior NCO Academy and the Chief Leadership Course. And then another aspect that we do with distance learning is all of that is combined underneath the Global College of PME that is run from Maxwell, but is obviously online through a fantastic partnership with Arizona State University. Yeah, it is absolutely amazing. And on the one hand, we have Dr. Bakhtiari with us here today. It's absolutely incredible. I have to brag on you, Sarah. It doesn't surprise me because 
Obviously, we know that you're completely intelligent and just amazing at your job and super smart, right? But really, the amazing thing is the Air Force really invests in developing every airman from an education perspective, you know, whether it's an airman, officer, enlisted civilian, it doesn't matter. So I just want to get back to Air Command and Staff College. What is the role of ACSC in an Air Force officer's career? And what is your developmental goal at this phase? Yes, yeah, so like I'll take that one. Air Command and Staff College's role is really to help our officers transition their leadership from tactical level proficiency to operational level proficiency for air power leadership in particular. Yeah, now I'm going to, I joke that I put the lieutenant and lieutenant colonel. So I have to joke, like this is where we get the lobotomy, if you will, because we have to make that transition, right? We as Air Force officers from being CGOs and really think, you know, in a broader sense, and it's not about being the best on the bomb range or the best doing BFM. So we always joke around, it's like, oh, it's like operation maturity, right? That's what we had to go through when it was time for ACSC. So appreciate that you bringing that background. But, you know, from like my time, things are changing and ACSC is not what it used to be. And I understand ACSC and the broader Air University enterprise has really been working hard to evolve its curriculum, to speak to the new security environment, you know, which we find ourselves today. So can you talk to us about what spurred you to drive this change? change and what does it look like? Yes, like it's really two parts. We've gotten feedback from our senior leaders, both within the Air Force and then from within the COCOMs that are out that when our graduates go out into the force, they represent the Air Force on joint staffs and warfighting staffs around the world. And we've gotten some feedback there that they that they needed some work on being prepared a little bit better for that. And then you kind of alluded to it there in, in your question, and the strategic environment has changed. And the way that I look at it is we're in a preparation phase of what could be an interwar period that we have got to be really focused on warfighting prowess, and that is what we try and instill in our students. So like the second part of that really is to speak to the what has changed, and I'll tell you that Aligned with the Joint Chiefs vision for PME and talent management that came out in 2020, the bottom line message for that vision was we need to have a war preparation mindset in our PME institutions. And so that's exactly what ACSE has been doing this year and will continue to do in the next few academic years is really focus in on war fighting mindset and specifically on air power leadership within the joint force. A big part of that has been the integration of air planning into our curriculum this year. And that means that every single one of our students is getting very familiar with how the air planning process is supposed to be done doctrinally, the ways they might need to deviate from that based on the context they find themselves in, and giving them lots of repetitions on the joint planning process and how the joint force operates so that when they find themselves integrated into a joint war fight, they are able to move very adeptly and to integrate air power into battle space effects for the joint force. Yeah, that, it sounds like you guys have made a lot of changes. And for those that are listening to the podcast that, that may have gone through 10 or 15 years ago, how does this apply to those folks and from a differences standpoint? Sure. Well, I mean, we're all aware that our international context has changed pretty dramatically in the past 10 to 15 years. So 10 or 15 years ago, we were in the middle of the global war on terror. We had primarily a counterinsurgency type emphasis in cultivating our war fighting skills. It was more the low end spectrum fight rather than a high end fight of major combat operations against a peer adversary or near peer adversary. And that's really the future of warfare that we're preparing our students for today. Right. What does that future look like? How do we ensure that we are cultivating the air power leadership skills for them to be able to operate under conditions of uncertainty and within the context of a lot of new technologies that have significant implications for war, but that we don't fully realize yet? And a big part of the opportunity that our students have at Air Command and Staff College is time and space to think and experiment with the new concepts and theories that they're exposed to, and then push 
the development of those ideas farther in terms of thinking about the implications for war fighting. So how does air control, for example, differ with the advent of AI and machine learning? What does the fighting in Ukraine demonstrate to us in terms of theories of air control and how that might be different from the theories of air control that we saw historically? In our favorite reference point, probably Gulf War One, where the U.S. Air Force absolutely dominated the skies and had a completely different experience with air control than what the Ukrainians and the Russians are experiencing in that conflict today. And I think that's been very surprising for us all to observe and try to interpret and think about what the implications are for the future of war fighting and the future of air control in a more high-end fight against a very capable well-equipped adversary that are out there today. Yeah. And one of the things that strike me, it seems like the higher end fight hasn't even begun to really challenge us yet, but we always can go to historical lessons learned when we're in a more permissive environment. So, and I love that you all are diving right into these really tough challenges. Are there any macro effects that you're trying to attain with the new curriculum? Yes. Like the piece that we're really trying to focus in on is really what is it that we bring to the educational landscape that no other school really does. And that, in, in our vision, that's twofold, right? There's that Im- increased lethality through improved understanding and, that, and how you apply air power in an operational environment, and then understanding that tactical leadership piece on, on investing in our majors and developing them in a way that will help prepare much better than I received or really probably what we saw from years past on on preparing them to be ready to take command and be impactful and to face kind of some of those unknown challenges. You never know when you step into command, what is the curveball that's going to be thrown at me tomorrow? Do your best to prepare, but you've got to, as Sarah kind of alluded to earlier, you've got to be able to operate under uncertainty and move forward in a way that continues to execute your mission. Matt, you just said something that really strikes me. I'm interested in your interactions with wing commanders and what they see out of the airmen that you're producing. They're the ultimate customer at the end of the day. Do they give you inputs or feedback or what about joint commanders? We do. We we actually spend a lot of our time and energy working on getting that feedback and getting feedback from multiple levels across both the Air Force and the Joint Force. And the feedback that we have received, and this is what you know, was the start of the change is they were showing up on a staff and they weren't necessarily prepared for executive level communications. They weren't, they didn't understand planning processes, joint planning processes. And that's what drove the impetus for change that our predecessors, Lee Gentile and Chewy Watt started. And we've been the beneficiaries of really having a like-minded approach to here's what we need to change within the school. So we've gotten the feedback of what needed to change now that we're roughly eight months into the first go, we feel pretty good about what we're seeing through our interactions with the students and the the feedback that we get from the students on how they feel their time is valuable. The various assessments that we perform within the school, they're performing remarkably better than their predecessors on things like air power operations. And then once they leave the school, we will have a concerted effort to, in its time phase, so over over time, so six months and then again in a year, we'll do polling and feedback from the students themselves as well as their direct supervisors on, do you feel you were prepared to be, depending on where they end up, if they're a J35 in Indo-PACOM, do you feel you were prepared to be in your position and as on a joint staff and what could we have done better? And we employ a rather talented young lady, Dr. Stephanie Irwin. She does all that for us and really leads that effort for us and does a fantastic job with it. Yeah, and if I could add, Slick, that part of that institutional effectiveness assessment process will absolutely involve polling those stakeholders in a face-to-face, direct kind of conversational way to get their very candid feedback about whether the skill sets that the ACSE education is delivering through our graduates are meeting their needs. Absolutely an emphasis item for us because we recognize that if they're not meeting the stakeholders' needs, then we need to go back and adjust fire. 
Absolutely. And it's funny after being a career instructor, and we kind of forget about our academic roots, if you will, but you'd be proud of me, Sarah. I actually did start my ed D. I just got a little distracted as I was going through and, and haven't finished yet. But um, can you walk us through it's something that I'm interested in here through the curriculum design process? How does that work? And where do you really start that process? Yes, like it's actually quite complex. And I think one of my insights from this year has been that we in PME might just be industry leaders in our ability to integrate our curriculum across a program. Because in the traditional civilian academy, those programs are highly divided in terms of who's carrying what expertise in the faculty body. And those faculty members largely have autonomy in developing their coursework and those syllabi that feed into sort of that overall program. But in the PME context, as a joint PME phase one accredited institution, we have just transitioned to outcomes-based military education. This is the new framework for joint education across the joint force. And what outcomes-based military education really means is that rather than just relying on our inputs, right, our thinking about what it is we are feeding to the students in terms of knowledge and skills and competencies, we are actually trying to evaluate the outcomes we are producing and approach it from that direction to ensure that those skills, knowledge, and abilities are actually being cultivated in the students. So what that looked like for us was, first of all, revising our program learning outcomes. What is it we are trying to achieve with our students? And it, to, to distill that down in a very simple way, it's really about air power leadership at the operational level of war, creative and critical thinking that is a wide-ranging skill set for leaders. And then the last part of that really is about dexterity, flexibility under conditions of uncertainty, and ensuring that they are prepared to operate in those contexts. So that's really step one, revising those program learning outcomes. Step two is figuring out how we meet all of the different outcomes we are trying to seek and the subordinate objectives nested therein across our program. What that looks like for us at ACSE is a process and a group called the Curriculum Inter Integration Working Group. And so that team sits down. It's comprised of all of our course directors from across the school, and they parcel out um, who is doing the primary lifting and hauling for a particular objective across the entire program curriculum and not just within a course. And so that allows us to achieve a level of integration that is, in my opinion, quite unparalleled in the educational enterprise. And I like to think of it as a tightly woven fabric that our curriculum represents across the year. Yeah, Sarah, my brother-in-law is an agronomist at the University of Kentucky, and I was explaining our process to him the other day when I was up at his house, and he just looked at me like I was an alien. He was like, how in the world do you guys get the faculty to do that? How is that even possible? Like, it was like we were talking about something that was the flux capacitor of education is what it seemed like to him. Yeah, that's a great point, Colonel Barry, and if I can go off script here for a second and say... That is only possible because of the incredibly committed and capable faculty that we have in PME. The faculty are comprised of a mix of roughly half uniform military faculty, Air Force, Joint Force, and international officers, and half traditional civilian academics that come to us with PhDs in military history or international relations theory, political science, in that kind of social science heavy disciplines, but they are extremely adept at connecting the dots between what the disciplines suggest are the key insights for war fighting and the operational and tactical experiences that our students bring in the classroom. And without that skill set, without that commitment and their excellence, we would not be able to achieve that level of curriculum integration. And it's something that actually doesn't go unnoticed by the students. Um, 
they remark in their end of course surveys and their end of semester surveys that the curriculum appears to build really well and they call out the excellence of our professors as the real asset that ACSC has. Yeah. And Matt, like your brother, not at his level, but I had the opportunity to teach at a university and that kind of the sluggishness that I experienced, and it sounds like you shared that your brother experienced is not what is going on at ACS. I mean, you seem like you obviously have a very motivated faculty. They're looking and seeking to, to be current and relevant. They're not just saying like, hey, I wrote my dissertation 20 years ago, and this is my story. I'm sticking to it, right? So it obviously seems like on top of that, you all have created a culture in which there's this expectation and desire to, to drive change and keep everything current. You're not just obviously stuck in yesterday's war, like maybe some have criticized in the past. You did mention it from student surveys and things like that, but are there any other ways that you measure this perceived effectiveness? I mean, how do you know if these curriculum changes are driving the desired results? It's like that's it's a really difficult thing to measure because our students come in as high caliber officers right at the mid career point. They have a lot of amazing experiences to bring to bear in the classroom and share with one another to create more generalized insights for all of the warfighters in the room. But that's not enough to know if we're doing the right work. I think it is really a full spectrum kind of assessment. It's listening to what our senior leaders need. It's hearing their perspectives on what they're worried about and what they expect the future of warfare to look like. And then aligning our outcomes to those national needs, right? Those national security needs. But measurement in, I mean, you said you're getting your ED, you probably know better than we do how difficult the sort of measurement science in the education domain is. So it is for sure an imperfect art. I think the way we are trying to get after it in the coming years will be the in-classroom direct assessments. So we are moving towards a more fully immersive warfighting educational experience And what I mean by that is instead of just a graduate level seminar discussion, which can be very fruitful and insightful and get after a lot of objectives, we are very much interested in ensuring that students are able to connect the dots between the theoretical and conceptual and the applied world. What I mean is standing over the map, right? That's the euphemism I like to use to say, it's one thing to talk about air control in the abstract or in a historical case study. It's another thing to actually look at the variation in air control theories while you're in time and space and all of the challenges and constraints that operating in time and space impose on you. And so it's really getting to a point where we are achieving a balanced mix of both the abstract, conceptual, and theoretical foundations and that more traditional graduate-style seminar and an applied scenario or exercise type of experience For example, today the students are in their air domain day of their contemporary warfare course, and they will actually put together an air scheme of maneuver for the blue forces in their seminar today. And so it is much more like a laboratory type environment that we are trying to cultivate so that students can connect the dots between these theories and figure out how they create battle space advantages in the actual battle space that we expect to confront. Yeah. And for our listeners that obviously I know that their socks are blown off just listening to you, but it really is a testament to the talent that we have down at Air University and also the students that are selected to go there. And I just wanted to point out to our listeners, this isn't like every single Air Force officer has the opportunity to go to this school and they are on a, they're high performing officers, as you mentioned, and they've been kind of selected to to go down this education track along with their leadership track. And so folks that are our United States Air Force Squadron Command and above, I mean, they are going through this course. So the leadership that 
that the Air Force gives the nation is really prepared, not only from their tactical experience, but also from their the academic rigor that, uh, that you just described. So it's absolutely incredible what you all do. And one of the terms that we use around Mitchell quite often is just this concept of air-mindedness, right? For us, that means possessing a set of skills and having an attitude such that you always looking to best apply air power in support of national objectives and secure results effectively and prudently. So we look at problems differently as airmen, frankly, of course, compared to the other services. And these different perspectives are important for the joint force commanders, right? Because we're bringing this diversity of idea and focus on air power and solutions to their staff. So air-mindedness is a defining difference versus what other services might teach at their PME institution. So how do you help cultivate that thinking with your students? Yes, like we do that in a couple of different ways. And I'm going to back up just a second just so that we can kind of establish some context here. And and I'm going to plug Sarah's uh, LinkedIn page. If you go to her LinkedIn page, you'll see a who's who of the Air Force picture of Sarah grabbing selfies. And it's kind of intimidating to go TDY with her because she's always on the prowl for which GO was a ACSC graduate that we can get a selfie with that she's going to post on LinkedIn. But the reality of that is, is you can see, and it's literally General Brown, General Raymond, General Anderson, I'm going to forget a bunch of them, but you can see one of the things that promote that air mindedness that is developed within the school is that opportunity to network, right? And so there's the You come to the school with other Air Force leaders, future Air Force leaders. It's a good likelihood that the future chief of staff of the Air Force is probably walking through the halls as a major right now. And so that's one aspect of it. But we have kind of a significant challenge in the fact that we bring in all these airmen. They have that tactical level expertise. They they understand air concepts. And then we're going to merge them with their sister service partners, right? The submarine lieutenant commander or an army major who might be artillery or the Nigerian officer who's got different challenges and different problems when they look at how do they affect their national intent from the air. And so the way that we do that is one of the first things that we do is we have a eight day air planner certification course. It's the very first eight days in the curriculum. All 500 officers go through and they do what the LeMay Center has put on for years is the course that you get before you go work in an air operations center. And it's an immersion, and they come out the backside, certified air planners. We could take every one of them on day nine and parachute them into an air operations center somewhere around the world. What we have found is that creates a baseline language and knowledge of this is what it takes to employ air in a planning sense, and it exposes them to JPA. It allows us to then use that as the context through the rest of the course on how we how we talk about the concepts that we're talking about when we're talking about air superiority, they already have an idea of what a cap is or they understand what seed or deed is. And that allows us to build on that over the course of the next 10 months. And so they're talking about air principles through a planning construct throughout the year and ingrains it in the, into them. And we're And then we're building those kinds of repetitions and opportunity to practice in a way that allows them to, Sarah had, describes it much more eloquently than I do, but it's essentially a, a opportunity to practice in a learning environment and fail without fear of safety, right? And it's a really powerful mechanism that we've instituted this year that has, appears to be extremely successful. Yeah, I mean, the concept of not being afraid to fail is tremendous, especially as we're trying to innovate and do new things. To me, SpaceX has been the example of that, getting to work closely with them. But one of the things that that I observe being a strategic communicator by training and background, we... We as an Air Force, I kind of call it, it's like death by humility, right? Because we're always like, yeah, you know, it was a great group of airmen and a team that did it together. And like compared to the Navy, they're like, yep, SEAL Team 6, this guy right here shot him in the head twice, right? It to- totally different way in-, in which our services engage. And we've kind of been bitten by that where I know General Golfin really spoke to, he's like, air power is like electricity. People just take it for granted and they flip the light switch and they expect it to be on. And the only time that... People go, oh, crap, what's going on here is when they flip the light switch and it isn't there. And luckily, our Air Force hasn't done that. But I'm asking and giving this example leading up to this question of what are you all doing at ACSC to really equip airmen to stand up and advocate for air power as an option when it's likely the best course of action, but circumstances in a given environment may not 
people may not receive those inputs positively. And basically what I'm saying here is a lot of co-coms are dominated by the other services and they may have some pretty heavy biases towards their domain compared to air power. So there are times when, you know, what's best for our nation and for the folks executing the missions is to pursue an air option. So that takes a lot of courage and convictions. So how do you help cultivate that mindset? It's like, I think there's a number of ways that we are developing those competencies in our air power leaders at ACSC. The first, and in my opinion, the most important of which is making them competent air power leaders at the operational level of war. And what that means is giving them the skills, the knowledge, the abilities, and the confidence to say, I know how to integrate air power into all domain operations as a part of the joint force, period. That is, in my mind, the supreme skill that we need to deliver for our officers at ACSC. And that enables them to speak to both the strategic, the operational, and the tactical significance of air power, right? I think it it doesn't go unchallenged very often that air power is a strategically significant capability for the United States. And General Milley was just remarking yesterday that war is a terrible thing, right? It is extremely destructive, and we all hope to avoid it. The way we avoid it is through strength, right? It is fundamentally about deterrence. And if we are able to articulate the effects that air power delivers, right, the signaling that air power does for us and the capabilities it brings to the battle space, then we are at once both building our strength and capability and at the same time deterring the enemy from thinking about any kind of military action. So I think that's part one. Part two is practicing their leadership skills. I think it's something that we recognize in the training environment, but less in the education environment. So training for something that is known and certain outcomes we are trying to get to, education more aligned to preparing you for uncertainty and how to navigate these wicked problems we're confronted with today. But all the same, if you are well-practiced in your leadership style and skill, if you know yourself as a leader, you are able to operate with a higher degree of confidence, and I would say more effectively in various leadership capacities in out there in the force. So what we have done at ACSC is double the amount of curriculum that we are providing students with that prepare them to take on these leadership challenges and perform in these leadership roles. And we have made it much more aligned to the jobs that they will do and in giving them the opportunity for experiential development along the way. That's going to increase over the coming years. But for this year, we have done a mixed reality leadership exercise where the students are able to engage with an avatar and have really difficult conversations with someone who is play acting on the other end about whether it's dealing with family trauma at home, whether it's dealing with diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. These topics that our senior leaders message to us are so important for the resiliency of the force and the retention of the force, but that we get very little practice actually navigating in our lead up to these critical leadership positions as squadron leaders, group and wing commanders. And so that's how we're approaching it at ACSC is really giving the students those fundamental competencies and being able to articulate what air power brings to the fight, know how to integrate it as a part of the joint force, and then developing their leadership skills through practice. Yeah, I love basically that you just said we send them to the sim, which is great, which is, I love it. So I really want to want to ask this next question too. What about lessons from history? We seem to find that airmen don't often understand air power history as much as we would think would be useful. So how do we address this deficit? Understanding our past is obviously a key to making smart decisions today and for the future. Yes, like I think the one of the ways that we have done and Sarah and her team have done this year that is innovative and really interesting in how it's working is through that curriculum integrated working group. What we are doing is we are centered around a principle, right? So let's take air superiority as an example. When we teach air superiority, what we are doing is we'll identify we're going to do air superiority on this day. Left of that day and somewhere prior to that day, we'll talk about the Battle of Britain so that we kind of introduced it in a historical con- We 
introduced air superiority in a historical context so that the students can understand this is what we're talking about. And then when we talk about the principle itself on that same day, we then tie it to some form of contemporary emerging topic. And in this particular example, look at Ukraine. Russia was unable to establish an air superiority over Ukraine, and it has bogged them down. And it's too early to say, here's why they lost the advantage, I should say. They haven't, they're still fighting, obviously. But here's why what they thought was going to be a very quick war has turned into we're already, we're a year in, and how long do we think it's going to go? And what it does for our students is it allows them to see how those lessons from history tie directly to what is going on and why it's important for their understanding in future context, right? And it's important for our students to to see that and understand it. We can't spend all of our time teaching every history lesson out there. What we want to do is we want to show them how you tie them together and then set them free so that they can go out and become the voracious readers that they need to be and build on that knowledge as they gain an understanding and appreciation. And it encourages them to do more as they move along. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, theme and theory is what we're looking at. And of course, we want to make sure that they do glean those and exercise them in their future decision making uh, ways of thinking. I want to pivot here, Sarah, because you're involved in an effort called Project Everest, and it's designed to help airmen better understand the China threat. So how do you help ACSC uh, students think about, you know, global interests through various lenses of our adversaries. And too often we mirror image and I think it's crucial to better consider what an actual opponent might think or be thinking when it's key to driving smart decision making on our side. It's like if I could go back and just give a quick intro to Project Everest first, I think that would be helpful for the audience. Project Everest is what we call an in-government startup. It has no formal organizational home, but it was started with several of my SAS classmates about a decade ago when we realized that we were coming to some really critical insights from our education at Air University, both at ACSE and at SAS, the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies, which is the Air Force's strategy school, and that we were coming to these insights pretty late in our careers, right? At more than the 50% mark of our career, potentially, if you're basing that on a typical 20-ish year career. And so understanding that the international landscape was very dynamic and changing, and we expected to contend with a rising China. And we were interested in being better prepared and preparing the younger generation, right, the officers coming behind us, to be better equipped to deal with those threats earlier in their careers. And so Project Everest set out to provide both classified and unclassified education and thinking from the adversary's perspective on their ways of war, right, their strategies, and to do that in a way that generated insights for our own defense initiatives. So that's a little bit of the background in Project Everest. I think that has really helped inform what we do at ACSC because we recognize that it's not enough to just understand blue force capabilities, right, friendly capabilities. We actually have to understand how our adversary thinks and how our adversary is equipped. And so we have integrated that into our curriculum in a very explicit way beginning this academic year. So China, Russia, integrated deterrence, these these states and their strategies and these concepts are tied into more than 60% of our curriculum in a very explicit way. And this is to ensure that across the the 40 plus seminars that we hold at ACSC and across all of the different experiences that our instructors and students bring, we are sure to touch on those topics and have thoughtful engagement with them through our program. The second piece is really through creating a framework of both friendly and adversary perspectives in our contemporary and emerging warfare course, which is a brand new course for this academic year, in which our students are actually in today. And in fact, your own General Deptula is there at ACSC today lecturing to our students about the air domain. I mean, what better person to do it than General Deptula? So he is presenting his perspective on the air domain, and that's a part of the framework we've created of canvassing both 
the friendly and the adversary perspectives and strategies for not just air power, but land power, sea power, maritime power in our contemporary and emerging warfare course. So we absolutely incorporate the adversary's perspective into our curriculum pretty extensively. Yeah, that, it's all incredible. Uh, quickly, are there any next steps that you're taking to build on the curriculum? Absolutely slick. Colonel Barry and our team at ACSC has developed a strategic plan for the college this year, and we are in the process of fleshing out the details of each of the LOEs that we have established, the lines of effort we've established for that strategic plan. A big part of that is recognizing that we are the air power school and that we need to create both the faculty through development and get exposure to the right sort of military operations that they might not have from their traditional academic backgrounds and getting the right students in the classroom and then getting the air power community linked up so that we can develop air power thinking for the Air Force, for the Joint Force, and for the nation through ACSC. So Laying out that strategic plan has already been accomplished, and it's fleshing out the details of the different courses of action on how we get after that, that our teams are working on very diligently. And we have brought our entire faculty into that process, right? So we recognize the talent that we have at ACSE, and we are incredibly grateful for their investment in co-creating the future of ACSE with us. In terms of kind of sketching out at the high level, what that looks and feels like over the next few academic years. Next year, so this year was really characterized by significant curricular changes, right? The content, the syllabi, the courses. Next year, we are looking at layering on a lot of active and applied learning. So every course, rather than relying principally on lectures to communicate a lot of the concepts and the knowledge, we are going to have the students doing applied work in the classroom, being responsible for a lot of their own learning. So some flipped classroom models, some models where they're the point person in the classroom for facilitating the discussion, scenarios like the ones I mentioned earlier where they get to stand over the map and get to reflect what andragogy, adult learning, suggests are really important to learners at this stage of development. So that's what next year looks like, integrating that applied and active learning into every course at ACSC. The following year, we're really hoping to create a full immersion environment where we have something like a year-long kind of war game going. And what I mean by that is dipping in and out of a war game throughout the various courses so that rather than having different scenarios or different exercises in different contexts in every course through the year, it would be fantastic to have the same framework occurring across the year. It's very efficient in terms of instructional management, and it's also helping build those knowledge layers for our students on the Indo-Pacific and where we expect our critical geographic areas to be moving forward. And then the following year, um, what we're really hoping to do is to elevate our experiential leadership game. And what I mean by that is allowing students in the context that I've just described of a war game or a scenario to practice their leadership um, roles in those specific contexts. For example, joint planning group lead is a great opportunity. We will need joint planning group leads in all of these different scenarios and in a war gaming context. So let's rotate that leadership opportunity around the seminar and give them several repetitions doing that over the course of the year so that by the time they get to our joint campaigning course at the end of the year, where they are doing sort of all of this now in a more concentrated and condensed format, they feel actually proficient by then. And to cap it all off with our war game, our week-long war game at the end of the year, then they should be almost expert by that time and navigating sort of the uncertainties that war games toss at you in a much more adept way. So that's kind of the broad brush, the trajectory that we're hoping to take the school down. And we've laid the groundwork to move in that direction at this point. 
Well, all right, uh, Matt and Sarah, again, I can't say thanks enough for having you here. It's been really a breath of fresh air to understand what you all are doing at the academic level to prepare our future leaders in the Air Force. So I just want to leave it open for any parting shots about what you're working on and what the future of ACSC looks like. Thanks, Slick. Absolutely. We appreciate Mitchell hosting us here. Um, Believe me, we believe in the strategic significance of air power, and we know that our role at Air Command and Staff College is to be the air power school for the joint force. No other school is going to hone the skills of our future air power leaders for employment at the operational level of war like Air Command and Staff College will. And so that's what we're getting after. We're getting after it aggressively and with the best faculty you can imagine. So we hope that we are doing our nation and our joint force a big service in doing that, but really appreciate the time to speak with you today. Yes, look, I appreciate you having us. One thing that I asked when I was leaving San Antonio was the opportunity to lead in a position that has impact. And I don't know of a better place to be to meet those two requirements. We are shaping the force that is going to be critical in a potential fight, regardless of where it's at. If it's a high-end fight, you're going to need high-end air superiority, dominance if you can establish it, but you've got to be able to fight and win in the air. That way we can win as a nation and continue to move forward. And ACSC is exactly where it's at. If uh, if you want to send your folks to, to learn how to fight in the operational construct and show up and be those kinds of subject matter experts that are going to fight and win through the air, send them to us, and we'll do the nation's work to get them ready and be ready to fight and win in the future. So thanks again for having us. We appreciate it. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.